I'm so happy that you're here. I, I think that uh, it's a terribly important thing that we're talking about. I think that uh, we have people in front of us today who are changing history, and I think that uh, we have a real chance to be a part of it. When uh, Poca and Leon suggested that we have a, a, a fundraiser uh, to uh, bring in a little bit of money to support Leon's travels, uh, I went for it. I, as time went on, I kind of changed the uh, approach because we weren't having very many people sign up for the fundraiser. We do have a bowl over here on the side, though, and if you feel like donating anything, we would be very glad to have that because it does cost an awful lot of money for Leon's travels, and we're trying to get other people to begin traveling with him. I, uh, I think that... Uh, the, um, the whole idea of what Leon is doing uh, is going to change our lives for the future. I think that POCA has really been working also on uh, the Hawaii National Transitional Authority, and I think you'll be inspired by that today. I, I hope so. I, I think that that's the way to go. And then at the end of the talk today, I'm going to uh, give a, some comments about the world situation and why I think that America is going to be happy to see us go uh, in another 20 years or so. Uh, and maybe, uh, then maybe you won't agree with that assessment at all, but I, I've been working on it for some time, okay? So I think what we'll do is start with just introducing Leon. Uh, Leon, see you, um, uh, as you know, as a part of the duo of Leon and Malia, uh, they, uh, they sang uh, my all-time favorite song, Ulilie, back in 1970s, and uh, I never forgot them, and uh, so it's good to have Malia here too, and uh, Leon then went on and began to uh, really get involved in working at the United Nations. Poca had uh, preceded him at the United Nations for years. But he's been at it now for, what, 30 years, 20 years? 40. 40. 40. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> he's, uh, he's made an awful lot of friends, and I'm going to shut my mouth and let him tell you all about it. Okay? Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction. Aloha, everyone. Aloha. 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 Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, so I've been at this uh, a little over 40 years. It's kind of interesting, because last uh, Saturday, um, I taped a uh, television, or actually we did a videotape of, of Lico, Martin, and, and myself, and we go oh. back over 50 years. And so we, we talked about our first meeting and, and then our adventures ever since. And so in the 40 years that we've been involved in the movement itself, uh, we started out really as musicians being asked to come and, and play at these di different protests and things like that going on, Kalama Valley, Waiholi Waikane, and of course, uh, Protect uh, Kaholawe Ohana, and all of these movements that were going on, and they got to be almost weekend, weekly uh, events. So we would go and we pray for these various types of things. So along the way, um, you know, we got much more educated about the issues themselves. Of course, if, for those of you who remember the 60s, um, that was the protest era, right? There was the counterculture and all these types of things. So all across America and really around the world, there was this whole questioning about the system that was we were entrenched in and, and basically a revolution going on about how do we change the system for the better. And you had all these folk songs which were protest songs um, and things like that which I was also involved in. And so, so it kind of naturally uh, came into, or I started working in this naturally. Um, so in the, in the 90s, well, Lots of things happened in the 70s and 80s as well, um, and I won't get into all of that. But it was really our becoming more and more aware of the situation. Um, and then there were, uh, you know, there were uh, rallies and things like that, like the only pa rallies at uh, uh, the Atlantic Palace and places in the, in the 70s late 70s, and then in the 80s, of course, the things were still continuing in the protests on Kahol Lavi. Um, and we were very much aware that, or began to teach ourselves or learn that there was something wrong here in the islands. Now, we had all been brought up 
Of course, uh, in the standard way, we were all Americans. We learned American history. I knew American history frontwards and backwards. And in fact, that was my major in, in, um, in at the university, was history and art. Um, so uh, so all the whole thing is that the, there began to form, we began to realize that there is a situation in Hawaii that really needs to be addressed. And in 1993, when President Clinton and Congress issued the apology, um, uh, you know, we, it really came to light, or it really became uh, much more obvious that uh, not only were we saying that there were some uh, problems here in, in the islands, but the Congress and the President themselves admitted that there was there were illegal illegalities that occurred. So uh, that really prompted a lot of things, and out of that came, of course, the movement uh, and various people stepping forward and, and starting up kingdom governments and uh, various degrees of restoration of, of the nation. Um, and many of them are actually still around today, uh, not as active as they used to be, but still, still there. Uh, so I came out of that period of time, and in, in 1995-96, um, I joined up with, with a group um, that uh, and this particular group was another one of the various uh, uh, yeah, groups that start up a government. But we decided we would emulate or we would stick to the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom in our, in our uh, working of this group. So part of that had to be a, a definite statement as to our nationality. That is, are we still Americans or are we now? Hawaiian nationals. And so out of that, we began to identify ourselves as Hawaiian nationals and went through a number of procedural uh, documentation to, uh, uh, to acknowledge or to address the fact that we're no longer U.S. citizens. And if you remember Hong Nani Trask in uh, 1993 saying, I'm not American, well, that's sort of the spirit. We're saying, we're not Americans. We're actually Hawaiian subjects or Hawaiian nationals. So this became uh, a part of, of really trying to re-identify who we are. Out of that particular group, Keo Puni Hawaii, we started functioning as, as what would be an interim government for the Hawaiian Kingdom. And out of that, we started appointing various people to take positions, such as the Minister of the Interior, Minister of Finance, the Attorney General, and, and fleshing this out and city, seating a, a Privy Council and a Cabinet Council um, and so there were actually hundreds of people involved in this particular um, organization or group I was involved in. Um, and uh, lo and behold, around 1990, I was, no, around two, the year 2000, I became appointed as the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Hawaiian Kingdom. Um, and so it was my job to relate to the rest of the world what was going on here in Hawaii and to see if we can reawaken or reinterest people in our situation and to re-enliven our the treaties that we had, the global treaties that we had. Um, and so this is how I got started. So that was almost 20 years ago uh, as the Minister of Foreign Affairs. So I've been on this journey all the time. In the last 15 years, I've been much more focused on uh, traveling and, and communicating and interacting with the various international bodies, and particularly the United Nations. Um, and I found, as I started to, to interact with the United Nations, I found a, a lot of things. One is the United Nations isn't the body that we usually think it is. Um, it's a pretty ineffective body. It really can't solve any problems and things like that. But it can make positions and statements and the countries can decide whether or not they're going to go along with it. And there's all kinds of dynamics going on that uh, are, are such dynamics that, that you cannot really predict uh, a, a logical outcome like you could if you went to court and you argued such and such and the outcome was a judgment on such and such. And the, the United Nations is much, uh, how do you say, softer than that. But it actually uh, has, is a place where you can come together and talk to each other. And that is the most uh, effective thing that we have, in, or effective body, 
uh, that we have to be able to discuss our situation to the rest, with the rest of the world. So initially, the rest of the world knew nothing about Hawaii. And um, were basically uh, of the attitude that, you know, they don't want to hear somebody's complaints about this or that. They simply want to go about doing what they're trying to do for their own countries. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was meeting with uh, the ambassador from, uh, from Jamaica, and he said something really, really eye-opening to me. He said, you have to remember, every representative here, every diplomat here at the United Nations is not here to do right or, or to do wrong or anything like that. They're here to watch out for the interests of their own country. And I thought, oh, now that's interesting. So whatever actions they take does not necessarily mean that they're either pro or against a certain action. They simply are saying, how is this going to affect my own country? I've been sent here to protect my country or to advance the interests of my country. So that opened up a lot of, uh, uh, well, it basically opened my eyes to the fact that not to take seriously what was going on, but to look behind and say, okay, these decisions and these actions are being made because it's in the best interest of a particular or a group of countries. So during this period of time, I, I started um, uh, discussing and putting out uh, various uh, pieces of information. I get this book with This is uh, uh, actually a book that <laughs> didn't end up on the floor. Anyway. Um, can you people hear okay? Is that much of a bother? Should I go next door and ask them if they could yeah, do something it's else? A it's a real bother. Oh. Yeah. He seems to be moving now. Yeah, he's moved oh. away. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, let's. Uh, yeah. So this is. Uh, uh, this is a little booklet that I first published in 2009, and decided that the people needed to know at least some basics about what was going on in Hawaii. And I have since distributed about 500 of these to various diplomats and heads of state and all that. I've never had one person come back to me and say, this is a bunch of a bull. Uh, everyone has said, wow, I really understand now, or I'm beginning to understand what's, what's going on. So, um, anyway, it's, it's updated. I update it every few months uh, just to, to keep people abreast of what's going on. But the basics are there. And it lays out uh, what, we, what happened in Hawaii as well as our, the basis for our uh, efforts to restore the Hawaiian Kingdom as a sovereign, independent nation. Um, and so among uh, the other things that I hand out at the UN meetings is... Is um, this figure handout, and that's an update. So this one was in September when I was at the United Nations in Geneva, um, and that updates people about what what's going on. Uh, now it doesn't have much specifics because a lot of the things that we're discussing at the UN uh, with individual countries and what they can do to help us uh, is still. Uh, sensitive so that we can't actually name the countries or, or say exactly what we're doing. But generally this is what, what I do. I, I keep people abreast and then when I meet with the di diplomats individually I'm able to fill in a little bit more. And that's one of the things that I found out in this uh, political arena is that much of the communication is actually verbal um, and very little is actually put into writing um, because people don't really want to commit themselves or be misquoted or be mis, uh, you know, whatever their uh, statements are made, they don't really want to have that out there. So, as a result, we, um, we're, we're very careful to protect the integrity of the various diplomats and the countries that we're uh, working with. Um, now, we do have, however, in the last Few, oh, well, last uh, eight or nine years, we've had numerous uh, pieces of 
uh, the press has, has covered our situation quite well. Mostly the press that's uh, in Europe and some in Japan as well, uh, covering our situation and referring to Hawaii as an occupied territory and things like that. These are things you don't really see in the US. Now this particular magazine ran this, this article um, in January of this year. They were going to run it last November for the 175th anniversary of uh, Laku Okoa, but uh, they ran into some, some problems with the publication, so they didn't run into January. But what we're doing is we're, these publications, these uh, uh, magazines, etc., are, are actually giving us, helping us inform the uh, general international community. So this is that, that article. Um, and we've had a number of articles over the years in this particular magazine and quite a few in other uh, newspapers, uh, particularly Le Temps and uh, uh, Reuters and a bunch of other services have distributed stories about what is happening, particularly based on some of the actions that we've taken uh, at critical points. Like, for instance, in 2015, uh, there was a whole a flurry of activity in the press about um, Pakistan asking the United uh, the United States about a question that really implied that the, the situation of Hawaii and Alaska uh, should be considered under international law. Uh, and it was a very innocuous sounding question, but it had huge amount of implications, so much so that the United States kind of bristled at it when, when they were asked that question. And it, uh, because of their dis decision to not even address it, the rest of the nations in the, in the room all said, okay, looks like we've hit a sore spot. The United States is trying to ignore this question, um, which they've done quite a few times. So what's going on is that uh, we've gained quite a bit of credibility. People are, are believing what we're saying and are ready to respond in whatever way they can. And, and I put a big emphasis on whatever way they can. Um, but they're ready to assist us. Uh, but there are several things that have to happen. And one is that nobody wants to confront the United States directly. Uh, so we had to find a way, and using their uh, advice, had to find a way to, for them to help us address the question, which is what we're, we're going to be talking about a little bit more today. Um, and that is to. Um, if a country were to, say, uh, question the United States and, or call for an uh, investigation of the United States and its actions toward um, Hawaii, uh, it would be quite suicidal on their part because there are many ways, as we all know, that the United States can respond or its allies can respond to harm that particular country that would dare to ask that question. Now, Pakistan did, did so uh, under the cover of a, uh, of, of a particular hearing that was going on at the time. But uh, other countries were, won't really want to start an investigation on their own. However, uh, when talking with them and talking with some other international experts and all that, we did decide that there is a way that we can engage or that, that other countries can assist us in engaging the question in an indirect way. In, uh, by engaging question in a procedural way and not directly questioning the United States but ask, actually asking for a review of an action by the United Nations that supported the United States. But we're not confronting the United States, we're basically asking the United Nations to look at its own action and then to, to, um, uh, to, to, res to act accordingly once they find out through their review what actually happened. Um, so, in other words, uh, what we're looking at is that the United States uh, reported to the United Nations, well, let's back up a little bit. The United Nations in 1946 uh, formed uh, a, an, a list uh, called the List of Non-Self-Governing Territories. And this was part of the United Nations policy to encourage decolonization. 
in the world. And so in the decolonization process, they wanted to identify the colonies in the world. So various countries that were colonizers submitted the names of the countries in which they had colonized. And so the list was about 100 countries at the time. Um, and since that time, most of those countries have been decolonized. There were 16 or so left on the list. 